Well, you're gonna go in to Dave <laughs> once. Once okay, this you're gonna go in to Dave once he's answering a question. I'm rolling right now. So I'm just okay, then you want me to? I'm rolling now. Did you want to? Excuse me. Did you want to lead with the American rockabilly thing, or did you have an order that matters to you? Dave, I know that one of your passions is American rockabilly. How did you become interested in it, or anything like that? Right. It's rockabilly. In other words, going but then back. we'll go from there then to his early influences and why guitar and, and then up to all that. Okay. Okay, quiet, please. And then after each question, I'm going to zoom back out and put the two of them in. Yes. Okay. You can tilt that a little. I don't, I don't need the guitar that much. Good. Good, good, good. Now, a slice. <coughs> a slice, all right. All right. This is uh, shot number one. Uh, it's uh, Jim introing Dave. And I'll do this. Four, three. Dave, you're known throughout the world as an authority on rockabilly, and yet you're a musician from Wales. How did you get interested in American rockabilly? Well, um, I guess it was when I was in school, when I was 13 or 14, and uh, the only radio station we had was BBC, which, and they didn't play much of that. And, but there was uh, Radio Luxembourg used to come on in the evenings, and they play all the American rock and roll stuff. And that was it, really. That got me. Who did you hear then? Oh, it was just all the stuff that was eventually got in the charts then. The, the Gene Vincent, Devley Brothers, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fat Stamina, Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry. Was it the sound of the guitar that struck you, or was it just the intensity? The, sound of the, the whole music? sound of the record. I'd, it was like as if they'd come from Mars or something, because you just had the, all this normal music before that, so sort of Johnny Ray and Patty Page, you know. And all of a sudden, this sound, it just, it just captured me completely. Was the, uh, the importance of vocals as strong as the importance of the instrumental sound? Um, I, I don't think I could... Uh, Pick and choose. It was just the whole sound and the the slap echo and the, that you know and the vocal and the guitars and the, it was the whole thing. But I eventually there was a guitar kicking around the house and I eventually sort of graduated towards that and became interested in guitar. How old were you at that time? Oh, I must have been twelve or thirteen. Did you take lessons? No. Nope. Just listen to the radio. Yeah, and try and we're, to figured it all out. Books? Yes. I mean, I don't think there there were even any guitar books around then. There may have been, but I, I wasn't aware of them. And I just actually worked it out. How many other guitar players were there in your, in your town then, about that same time, you think? Well, uh, yeah, so I suppose it, it started happening all around the country at that time. That myself and... Um, I felt as if I'd discovered it for myself, but obviously other guys were doing exactly the same. Uh, great. Did you feel uh, at all isolated from the other youth? Uh, or was it, did you feel part of a sort of an avant-garde movement? Yes, I suppose so, because all the other kids in school, they, they were just into sports or whatever, and I was just, all I could think about was rock and roll. Then eventually you meet someone else and you put a band together and that's how it started, and start playing around your hometown. That's what I did. What, uh, what was it about, specific, specifically about the guitar that made you want to gravitate to that instead of, say, of the bass or drums or even, you know, trumpet and saxophone? I think it was Chet Atkins. I discovered, again, I, th I felt I'd discovered Chet Atkins myself, because uh, um, that, that style of guitar playing where he's accompanying himself was just, that absolutely fascinated me. I could not believe that someone could do that. So I, I was slowing down the records to half speed, and learning all the licks. And uh, then I realized Scotty Moore was doing a similar sort of thing um, with Elvis Presley. And the whole thing just became totally fascinating for me. Do you remember when you first saw American rock and roll bands abroad? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't think of an answer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. I wow. tried to cool it. The last question was, uh, why a guitar today? Uh, no, do you, do you uh, remember who you first saw? What I was thinking about is the difference between hearing, the impact of hearing the music on radio and record versus the impact of seeing somebody up on stage and okay. hearing things live. Back to the two shot. All right. And you, you can ask the same question. All right. All right, stand Is by. that a good? Mm. Okay. <laughs> this is a pickup uh, shot one. Code number going down? Yeah. And four, three.
you recall who you first saw live? I mean, was there a difference between hearing rock and roll guitar on record and on radio as opposed to seeing somebody standing up there in front of you? Well, in those days, they used to do package tours, as they were called, and you'd have sort of uh, 10 or 12 acts on, and they'd do two or three songs each. I saw Gene Vincent and Eddie Cochran. They came to my hometown, and that was just amazing. On the same in fact, level? I was backstage and sitting in the wings looking at it. Oh, it was great. Was it, was it a different feeling for you, the impact? Well, it, it, it took it even further, just the whole thing. The stage lights, you know, rock and roll on stage, the audience going crazy. It was all part and parcel of that. Uh, somehow you've managed to take blues influences, rock and roll influences, country influences, and put them all together into music that has been uniquely Dave Edmonds. Um, do you have a feeling about what the, the relationship is between these things? They were essentially rather diverse musical styles. I suppose it is, but I didn't know that they were at the time. It was just my ignorance of it. I just thought um, it was just all fascinating, and I couldn't see any reason why not to, and just fuse them all together. Probably if I'd have known more about it, I wouldn't have done it, but I'd, just in my youthful innocence, I just um, put them all into one category. And, and got to learn to play it. Well, you've seen a lot of guitarists over the years. You've produced many successful bands from Foghat, Brinsley Schwartz, uh, and certainly uh, the Stray Cats. As a producer, what do you look for in a guitar sound? What do you look for in a guitar performer? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, guitar sounds. It's, um, th it's not always easy. It's not the easiest instrument to record with amplifiers. Anyway, that's where very often I plug straight into the desk. But um, it's quite hard, and, and Brian Setz has got it down, actually. He's, he gets a great sound in the studio. We were trying to get the, uh, a, non, a, a sound that's not distorted, but still punchy and big, and a big sound. That's quite hard to achieve. But Brian seems to do it you know, with his choice, the way he plays, I think, his choice of guitar and amplifier. It works very well. Who are some of the guitar players today that have struck your fancy? Who do you think we're going to be listening to? Or what type oh, of players? Oh, there are many fine players. Um, it's amazing. There's so many out there. Well, as, as the, the reigning authority on rockabilly, <laughs> who do you think has uh, got it covered? For rockabilly, it's got to be Brian Setzer. Streets ahead of, of anyone else. And, and he's made it popular as well. Uh, not just playing it, and there are a lot of purist rockabilly bands around, but to actually get it up there in the charts and get everyone listening to it, it's got to be Brian Setzer. Now, it seems to me that's an excellent place for you to go to the... Brian Setzer. Five, four, three. up a wee bit more. Spin. Okay, uh, come right ahead. All right. Can you believe this on a Sunday night? <coughs> what is going on out there? What? <coughs> this is a pickup 2A, uh, Scotty Moore. You copy this, don't you, Ron? You can hear me. And in four, three. You got horns like crazy. Oh, Ron will stop us if it's a problem. Uh, in the bands of that time, the early rock and roll bands, of course, there were drummers, but you didn't take up drums. And there were bass players, and you didn't take up bass. Why, what was it no, about well, guitar? Gu guitar was my, my instrument. I think it was Chet Atkins. Um, he had a, fa well, he invented, more or less, uh, a fascinating style of accompanying himself. Which, uh, oh, good. He didn't invent it. Can I ask? And this is a take two of... Uh, 2A, Scotty Moore. In four, three. Uh, Dave, in those early bands, there was, of course, a drummer, but yet you didn't take up drums and bass players, and you didn't take up bass. Well, why the guitar? No, guitar was the one for me. Um, I think Chet Atkins, uh, his style just fascinated me, where he could accompany him himself with his thumb. And um, it, it's a Really fascinating style of music. I used to buy all his albums and s slow them down half speed, learn all the, the riffs. And, uh, wonderful. Scotty Moore used the same technique as well with, uh, with Elvis. Uh, I think probably because there are only three of them and he had to fill out the sound somehow. So 
he was accompanying himself. And that style of guitar playing, I have to say, is my, my favorite of all. Well, people like Scotty didn't have anyone to emulate as today's players do. They were, they were making it up from, from yes. day one. I think maybe he got some of it from Mel Travis and, Ch and Chet Atkins. Um, but it, he played beautifully on the, and the sound he used to get on those early Elvis records. I don't know why, but I've never heard that sound since on record. It was just a wonderful sound he used to get. Were there other players that um, struck you that much? Uh, in oh, yes, days? James Burton, especially. And James went on to do uh, replace Scotty later on. Yes, and played right. with Elvis for years. Yes, I think one of the classic um, rock and roll guitar solos of all time has got to be Hello, Mary Lou. That is just wonderful. What about people like um, Buddy Holly, Carl oh, yes, Perkins? Yes. Was Sonny good. Curtis as well. Did some good stuff. Did you get to hear those people? Were, were many young players in, in, the, um, in Britain listening to players like that very often? Or was it just sort of a, a, few, a few radicals? I think it was, there? actually. I sort of like to think so, in a way, because then you, the shadows came out in England, and everyone was trying to play like Hank Marvin. I don't know if you're aware of his uh, Oh, thing. sure. Um, yes, it, it's, it's kind of a little cl It feels like you, know, you belong to a club or something. In a way, was the guitar a bit of a symbol for that youthful rebellion among you guys? I suppose so. It's strange. A guitar, I can't think of any other instrument that is such as an extension of, of the personality. Um, and like, like a piano, you can get nice pianos, and synthesizers certainly don't have that quality. There's something about guitars that uh, it's just fascinating. Good. Okay. Perfect. Now what is what shot is this? Three? Mm -hmm. Okay, stand by. Everyone settle down. Come into come right a little bit, Ron. Right. It's just oh, so we shot. Well, I'm doing it I guess. Okay. You know, I'm sitting here. Right, we have speed, whatever And uh, this is uh, shot three about Chuck Berry. Take one. In five, four, three, quiet. So, excuse me. Quiet, please. And go. You're advertising Heineken. Oh, no, they're not showing me. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, you'll have to engage the camera. Yes. Oh. We're not just talking. Oh, no, no, this is, this is a solo. <laughs> just an well, what do you want me to say? Well, may, maybe it should be over there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, what about Chuck Berry? Yeah. Just say, what about Chuck Berry? We're rolling. What about yes, Chuck Berry? I'm rolling. So this can be for you, too, if you need that. And any time you want. Certainly one of the most influential rock and roll guitar players has been Chuck Berry. Oh, Chuck Berry, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, very important. Uh, and it, his style was sort of based more on feel than technique, I think. Um, it's very hard to not play a Chuck Berry riff sometimes. I think if you d decided to um, do... Um, oh, I dried up there. Sorry. What was I going to say? Take two of... <coughs> And this is uh, take two of shot three in five, four, three, two. Chuck Berry. <laughs> What's taking time? Go yeah. slow. Chuck Berry practically invented rock and roll guitar playing. He wrote the book that other guitarists have been stealing pages from ever since. Nice. Pause it. Do you think you could uh, and unpause? Five, take your time. Breathe. And whatever you read. Chuck Berry practically invented rock and roll guitar playing. He wrote the book that other guitarists have been stealing pages from ever since. Nice. You like? That's nice. Yep, I like a lot. Done with that? Mm -hmm. okay, yes. Nice and slow because okay. it's a long ride. And it's a uh, second button. Speed up speed. British Blues, this is shot four, this is take one. And take your time. Four, three. Two. 
The blues influence in England was e the blues influence in England was even more widespread than in America, with John Mayle, Alexis Corner, and Peter Green among the others leading the way. No, that's a bad script. This is yeah, change it. among pause it. Yeah. This is a British blues. Take uh, okay. five. The blues influence in England when it. The blues influence in England when. What's the matter? Uh, it's, just, it's me. It's, no, no, it isn't. The blues. <laughs> the blues I keep saying Woth. <laughs> Woth even more. The blues influence in England was even more widespread than in America, with Eric Clapton, Peter Green, and Alexis Corner leading the way. The British blues boom erupted in the 60s, in the, the mid-60s, in the hands of genuine guitar heroes like Keith Richard, Pete Townsend, Jeff Beck, and Jimmy Page. Yeah, that's nice. We're going to get there. Mm. Rest. Uh, Rolling five, four, three, three. I notice your seconds are getting shorter. <laughs> <laughs> Speed. Over the one. This is British blues. Take three. The blues influence in England when it was even the blues influence in England was even more widespread than in America, with John Mayle, Alexis Corner, and Peter Green leading the way. The British blues boom erupted in the mid '60s in the hands of genuine English guitar heroes like Keith Richard, Pete Townsend, Jeff Beck, Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton. I think we got it, you like that? That's great. Mm. Is the and Eric Clapton without fit? This is intro to Steve Cropper, take one, shot number five. And three. It's ironic that one of the leading art it's ironic that one of the leading architects of 60s American soul music was a white guitarist from Memphis named Steve Cropper. Steve worked with Booker T and the MGs and co-authored classics like Green Onions, Dock of the Bay, In the Midnight Hour, and In the Midnight Hour, sorry, and again? Yeah, that was great. Yeah, uh, Rob, just, to, just keep that, I like yeah, that. Yeah, still rolling. Still rolling, this is uh, take two. Um, take time. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Is that good? Yes. Okay. It's ironic that one of the leading... It's ironic that one of the leading architects of 60s American soul music was a white guitarist from Memphis named Steve Cropper. Steve worked with Booker T and the MGs and co-authored classics like Green Onions, Dock of the Bay, and In the Midnight Hour. And in the late 70s, Steve anchored the Blues Brothers Band. I like it. You like it? Hmm? Yeah. 